why do you think we repeat these negative patterns in relationships so frequently? We, you know, we have a bad experience in one relationship, we look for someone new, and then it repeats. And then we do it again and again. Why does that happen for people? We're looking for a resolution. In the back of our minds, we might not even be aware of it, but we're looking for a resolution to that thing that happened or to that story that said you're not lovable or that story that said you have to fight to earn love. And so somewhere in our minds, we're looking to prove that story true or we're looking to complete the process. And so we look for somebody who matches the template, right, like we just talked about, so that we can perhaps do that work. And typically it hasn't worked out because we, what we don't realize is that our partner is doing that exact same thing. <laughs> but with the self-awareness and the willingness piece, if we're both aware and we're like, okay, we both do have some stuff to work on here. Here's what I've got to work on. Here's what you want to work on. Do you want to do this together with that frame? Then we really can get on the same track together and team up and, and do that healing work. Otherwise, it just does repeat endlessly. And it's easy to just blame the other person. Well, there's something wrong with you. I'm just going to get rid of you and go and find my, my soulmate. Right, the next person. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Interesting. What was the, the best thing you did before getting married the second time? Yeah. And that really supported entering the marriage? And then what was the thing you wish you would have done before getting married? the second time around that maybe, oh, we didn't have this conversation or create these agreements or? Yeah, the thing that I love that we did was we created shadow vows. Shadow vows. Yeah, and those were sort of, we also call them ownership vows. So we wrote our sacred vows to each other, but then we also did ownership vows. And so at our wedding, we had a different type of wedding where we had... (laughs) Everybody actually sat in a circle on the floor. Only the elders in our community sat on chairs. And we had all of these plush rugs everywhere. And uh, we did a cacao ceremony and a group meditation. And then we, you know, we stood in front of our community. And we had spent a month negotiating our shadow vows. And essentially, we were calling out the parts of ourselves that were not yet healed or the, some of the worst things that we're bringing to the relationship. Things and we you don't were, like about yourself. Or, whatever, or the, yeah. the ways that we show up in a crappy way with our partner, which there's always ways, you know? And so we did that, we wrote it down and we shared with each other. And we also allowed each other to give feedback before we did this. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Is there anything here, you know, that I, is there anything that I do that you want me to own? And, and we used that, we did that in front of our community. We stood and we, we owned, you know, Holy cow! you know, I own that I'm going to project my unhealed father wound onto you sometimes. You know, and I promise that I'm going to always come back to love. That's the kind of vows that we said. And so it was very vulnerable and intimate, but everyone in our community got to witness. This is the true Shalina and Ben. These are the things that they're working on. We're not painting this perfect picture. And then they vowed to hold us through that. And then every year, what we do is we take our shadow vows And we go through them together and we say, oh, I think I've actually worked really well on this one. Maybe we should take this one off the list. Maybe that one has been completed. Or maybe we need to add this to the thing, you know, (laughs) maybe we need to work on this one. And so we actually reassess our vows. We sort of use it as like a template to check in, do a temperature check. And uh, that has served us very well. And we've guided other couples through that as well. So that's the thing that I loved the most. What's the thing you wish you would have done before marriage that you didn't do? Definitely would have been more somatic work, more nervous system work. Uh, That's something that I started the year that we got married. And it was because when we got married four years in, all of a sudden I started feeling like I needed to escape. My ego was like, oh God, get me out of here. Get me out. (laughs) Yeah. And what have I done? Right. Because what if this was the wrong decision? I'm going to look like a fool. I should have waited three years and this and that. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Well, we had already been together four years and I was like, we should have waited seven, you know? Right. And um, the funny thing about that is because I, you know, the seven year itch. Have you ever heard the seven year itch thing? Tell me. Well, in Canada, maybe this is a Canadian thing, but they talk about the seven year itch where a lot of couples break up after seven years. But then my friend told me that actually that has been proven untrue. And it, it's been proven that it's actually the four-year itch. And we got married at four years. So I had all that stress uh, for nothing. Maybe this is the time to leave. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But my nervous system didn't know how to stay. 
And so because you've never been in a safe, committed, fully ever. committed, yeah. And not in a relationship where I had all of the things. Like we had good chemistry and we had the spiritual connection. It was healthy. It was always one or the other. And so my body was starting to freak out and I wanted to run in the other direction, even though I was trying to tell myself I'm safe. And so I had to do some deep nervous system reworking to get into a place where I no longer felt like I needed to escape all of the time, even though I knew consciously that it was good to be where I was in this relationship. And that work is sort of what I ended up going and training in over the last four years because it was so powerful for me I realized this is the thing that we all need to do is create security in our bodies and yes. our nervous systems yeah you can't you can only outthink so many things yeah you cannot think emotions and stress and the body's memory you yeah. have to process feel heal and integrate this healing consistently and it's not just a oh I had this like experience of an hour session I feel a sense of relief and I process some things if you don't integrate that lesson consistently until the next trigger, it's going to keep coming back. And so what was the somatic healing therapies that you practiced in the first year that really supported you? A lot of it was somatic experiencing. And What is uh, that for people? So Peter Levine, he's now in his 80s. He's a wonderful teacher. He's, I would say, the godfather of somatic experiencing work. He created it. He wrote Waking the Tiger. It's a very old book. Um, I shouldn't say very old, but... It's old. Older, yeah. <laughs> it's older. And uh, so it's this body of work that where you're literally working on the most subtle level with the organs and with the nervous system to help the body move out traumatic experiences and memories. It's kind of like a raking experience or what is this, like a body talk experience? You know, you could maybe say that it's similar in terms of what it looks like uh, where you're yeah. laying on a table. If you have someone who's trained in touch work, you can also just do it with yourself. You know, I have online stuff where I take people through in their own bedroom somatic work, but working with a practitioner is ideal. And, you know, maybe they place a hand on your kidneys or on your arm and it's wild what happens. The releases, right? Yeah. yeah. The, you feel the energy moving and releasing. Well, and your body might start shaking. Yeah. You could actually start feeling triggers arise in your body and the practitioner is trained to help you move it out of your system. So for example, if that's like a fight response that you got frozen in, they might allow that response to come up and then they'll hold their hands out and say okay now kick and say no and you're actually completing that process so that it can move through your system because when we're holding that fight in our system we're either going to freeze or we're going to be in fight mode all the time in our relationships and so that's just one example of how powerful it can be because that's the body memory that we can't outthink and so if we move it out of the system our behavior changes because we have the capacity to change. Because our body has completed that cycle. It's created new meaning. Yeah. It's released it. It's processing yeah, it. Yeah, it's moved through it. It's interesting. I did this, I did a thing called body talk. I kind of want to do it again because it was so powerful for me. I did this like 10 or 12 years ago. I only did like a handful of sessions. And the practitioner um, at the time wasn't even touching me. And I remember I was like, I would, I was wide awake, but then within 10 to 15 minutes, I was somehow fell asleep and I would wake up like an hour later, I guess, with my whole body shaking and I'd be on my back. And it was almost like I was just rocking like this, my whole body. And it was my heartbeat out of my back, pushing my body off the, the table. I was just laying there and I just be rocking like this, my heartbeat. And I just felt all this energy moving through my body. And I was like, wow, this is fascinating. Someone's not even touching me and how this is happening and processing. I don't think a lot of men typically would hear this and think, I want to try this. You know, I, I was pretty open-minded at that time, but before then I wasn't open-minded. It was kind of like, nah, eh, just give me a massage or, you know, I'll, I'll work out and <laughs> yeah. toughen it out. You not know? into that stuff. Yeah, but I think it's, um, you know, it's powerful for, for men as well as women to be open to trying some of these things, especially if you have emotional triggers or wounds that have caused you a lot of anxiety, pain, or relational issues. Um, that's beautiful. So you're doing that for like a year and you, you're still doing it, but that's what helped you really heal. You wish you would have done that before marriage. Absolutely. Yeah. I started out doing sessions with a practitioner and after a year I realized how powerful it was. And so then I began to train in it so that I could actually facilitate this work with my, my readers uh, because it's just amazing how 
potent it can be. And it's so subtle. You're like, did I just do anything in there? Go for a session, just holds your kidneys for an hour. And then I'd go home and sleep for three hours. I would just pass out because my, my nervous system was integrating. It was just wild stuff. That's amazing. What do you think are the, the key distinctions to conscious relationship and healthy love? Willingness again, you know, being willing because we're not going to be perfect and we're going to fall off track and we're going to fall into old patterns. But the willingness to repair, you know, the Gottmans, they talk about this a lot too. Uh, repairing is so important, being able to take ownership, being able to apologize and, you know, being willing to see our part being willing to see the ways that we are contributing to the breakdown of the relationship and also acknowledging that to our partner, you know, sort of revealing our vulnerability underneath the defensiveness. And that's one of the things that I tell people when they say, oh, you know, you and Ben must just eye gaze all day and, you know, have these sacred practices. And, you know, <laughs> like, well, sometimes we do that now that we have a daughter. We'd never do that right, right now. You know, we have a baby. Uh, but it's, it doesn't really look like that. It's really just about being present in each moment and doing your best and doing your best to love your partner as much as you can. And remember that they were once a child. Like we have little photos of each other as children on our right. altar in our bedroom. Wow, that's beautiful. And that helps when you see the little, you know, for you, your little Martha, uh, you know, you have a little photo of her on the fridge. If you're having a moment where you're feeling butt hurt, and then you go and look at little Martha, you're like, oh my gosh, how can I be mad at this beautiful being, you know, this beautiful, innocent being? And it takes work to come back to that innocence over and over. Sure. And, and to me, that's what conscious relationship is about. Mm. What is the skill you wish you could have mastered by now that you haven't mastered yet? Oh my gosh, a skill that I... Like a relationship skill or just any skill? A relationship skill. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say like triple <laughs> axle. <laughs> uh, a relationship skill, I would say, would be uh, mastering the art of always being present. I still don't have that down. And that's the thing that I'm most drawn to mastering is presence. Even as a new mother, presence is the most beautiful experience for me and anytime I am in deep presence with my partner everything else fades away you know the ego any anything that's in the way so that's what I would love to learn in this lifetime that's beautiful why do you think so many people are struggling today in relationships is it wounds is it they haven't healed is it they have a, a bad model of relationships from their parents probably all is of it, it? The, you know social media what do you think is hurting people today in relationships everything you just said social media is a tough one right now we have these human meat markets right where you're supposed to go shopping for a partner mm. and you're grading them based on what their photo looks and so much of it is bio. energetic yeah. right and you don't know who this person is i'm the kind of person who I don't care if you're a supermodel, unless I can feel you, I don't actually even know if you're attractive or not. And so for me, it's really about that deep spiritual bond. So, so many of us are, we're shopping in these human meat markets for people and it's not working and it can even become addictive. So there's, that's it a real addictive. thing. Just like you know? swiping or like, yeah. yeah. Dating app addiction. Uh, and of course, you know, we don't have many templates for healthy relationship that we don't see it much in the media at all it's a lot of chaos and we also many of us don't have elders anymore either we don't have those people who can support us and guide us or who can remind us how to come back to love when we need help in our relationships so so often something gets hard and we just throw the relationship away because we don't know what else to do and so my hope is that through this work that I'm doing, that you're doing, that we're all aiming to do is that people feel that they have a container they can step into so that they can stop glamorizing the idea of the perfect relationship and just start learning how to be happy. Why do you think so many people struggle with feeling loved and lovable? It's the age old question, isn't it? I think we're born and all of a sudden, we have these human fallibilities where we struggle to believe in ourselves. We struggle to believe that we're good enough. And it seems that it's built into the human condition in some ways that we come in with these stories. And, you know, some traditions believe, you know, you cut the umbilical cord and you're separated from spirit or from God or whatever you'd like to call it. 
And so in the human realms, you know, we're going to be experiencing these, this type of suffering. And I feel that a lot of that can be nurtured in childhood. And it seems that no matter what, we all come out with some sort of insecurity or pain story or trauma or life lesson to work with. And I sort of imagine there's this celestial team, you know, in the cosmos with stamps and they're just choosing, oh, this group of babies is going to be born. Here's your life path. Here's your life <laughs> path. And they're just spitting them out. It sounds funny, but that's kind of the cartoon that I've made in my mind because it helps me remember that we all come here with a path. We all have something to learn and we're not here to interfere with people's paths so much as we are here to just encourage and be loving along the way. And that goes for being a parent too. We can't change their life path, but we can interfere with it. And so the most loving thing we can do for everyone that comes into our lives is to honor their experience and to do our best to be kind while we're on the, on yeah. the journey. What do you think is going to be your biggest shadow challenge while being a mom? My biggest shadow challenge, well, I'm only six and a half months in and it's already been such a deep ride. I've experienced so much heartache over the impermanence uh, of this new life. You know, everything just changes so quickly. And one of the things that I've noticed is that it's very easy to uh, want to just, just save her from everything, like just keep everything perfect for her and like never have a bad moment, you know, never express my own anger, you know, never have a snappy moment with my husband. Uh, just be the perfect loving mother where she never experiences any discomfort and pain. And I also know that that's not human. And so that's actually been confronting for me is to see my own sometimes innate desire to just save her from any pain and having to let go. So it's a bit of that devouring mother archetype where I just want to like keep her close. Yeah, yeah. So I'm working on that. That's good. That's good. <laughs> That's great. Well, I'm really excited about this. Uh, you've got an amazing book called Becoming the One um, and an amazing community called Rising Woman, which has you know, taken over the internet and has an amazing community and message of empowering people to really learn these strategies of healing and overcoming the trauma and creating a new vision for your life and having deeper relationship with self and others. Uh, so I want people to follow you over on social media, Rising Woman and also Becoming the One book, which has been a massive, big, uh, big bestseller. Um, how else can we be of service to you and support you? Thanks. I mean, reading my book is great. Be of service to your families. That's, that's the legacy that I hope to leave behind, is helping people be more loving in their family systems. Because I've always felt overwhelmed by how much pain there is in the world and I always have this drive like I want to save everyone from their pain and I want to feed all the children and I'm starting to really get how important it is that we just do that on a community level and so the greatest gift that anyone can give is to take something from my work or my book or an interview that I have done and say you know I'm going to just be of service more to the people in my life around me yeah that's great it's beautiful um got a couple of final questions for you this one's called the three truths okay so imagine a hypothetical scenario it's your last day on earth many years away you get to live as long as you want to live in this world but then yeah. you got to turn the lights off and go somewhere <laughs> else and you've accomplished all your dreams and you've got the family the relationships everything you wanted to create it's happened um, but for whatever reason, you got to take all of your messages with you, all of your book, content, information. It's got to go to the next place. Okay. So no one has access to anything you've ever shared before when you leave. Hypothetical. But you get to leave behind three things you know to be true, three lessons that you'd share with the world. From all the things you've learned, what would those truths be for you? One of those truths would be that love truly is the only thing that matters when we go that the greatest gift that we can give the world is to love our families. And that presence is all we have. I would acknowledge you, Shalina, for everything you've overcome, for your journey and for your courage to, to talk about it, to use the pain and the trauma and the challenge 
and share these lessons with the world. You've helped so many people heal, grow, understand the chaos of their life, get out of challenging relationships, uh, you know, do the work to get into healthy, conscious relationships. So I really acknowledge you for your entire life story and using it for good, using all the pain, all the trauma, all the sadness, all the darkness for good. And I'm so grateful that you're in a healthy relationship now and got a great guy with you. Uh, I'm so happy for the family you're building and I acknowledge you for the light you bring to so many. It's really beautiful to watch. Final question, what's your definition of greatness? These are great questions. For me, my definition of greatness in terms of like what I see as greatness is integrated humility and praise and the, the capacity to celebrate and enjoy life and also the capacity to feel the grief and, and the pain of the other side of joy and love. I was actually really scared of men because my mom came from a lot of abuse and she didn't have a healthy template. And so the things that she said about men were not good. Scary. So I didn't hear any good things about men. And I never had a dad that came home at the end of the day. So I would be at a friend's house and the moment the dad would come home, I would be terrified and I would always leave. Really? 